Hi, my name is Steve Joachim. I'm the sales manager at Location Sound Corporation. Uh, we sell and service uh, professional audio gear for the movie and TV industry. Uh, most of our customers are production sound mixers, and we're going to talk a little bit about film sound. Uh, when you're doing film sound, uh, there's really two ways it can be done. One, you're going to use what we call a dual system, which is you're going to record your film or your video on the camera, and you're going to record the audio on a separate recording device. Uh, the other way to do it, of course, is to record the audio directly to the camera, which is very common with documentaries um, or low-budget features and other kinds of projects like that. So we're going to cover kind of both of those. But before we do, we want to talk about the most important piece of gear for film sound. Of course, that's going to be the microphones. Um, there are several kinds of microphones, and we need to cover exactly what those are. The first and most common kind of microphone is a dynamic microphone. It's often used for vocalists and singers and bands. Uh, a dynamic microphone operates on the principle that the vibrations of the voice turns the sound into an electrical current. Dynamic microphones are very insensitive microphones. They're meant to be held directly up to the mouth, and they're meant to be sung into loudly or spoken into loudly or screamed into in the case of rock and roll. You're very rarely going to use a dynamic microphone in a film situation unless it's a direct interview where you're holding the microphone directly up to the interviewer or the interviewee's mouth. Uh, another example where you would use a dynamic microphone would be in a situation where you're going to record a very loud noise and you need an insensitive mic to do that, something like a gunshot or a car backfiring. In those situations you might use a dynamic microphone. Normally, you're going to have a microphone that will be two to three feet away from your talent and you need a more sensitive microphone. And you'll see that a dynamic microphone won't provide that for you. So let me give you an example of that. On this dynamic microphone I'm going to pick up, if you hold it directly up to your mouth, you get a good signal. If you try to move it away from the, mic from the mouth, this is what you're going to get. As you see and as you can hear, the sound is dissipating greatly. This microphone is not designed to be held this far away from the talent. So you'll very rarely use a dynamic microphone in uh, uh, film sound, unless you're doing an interview or something. A common microphone for production sound mixers will be a interview microphone. This is a Biodynamic M58 omnidirectional interview microphone. So this is very common. Uh, one of the great features of an interview microphone, of course, is that they're generally going to be very insensitive to handling noise, and you're normally going to see a very long handle on it. And the reason for that, of course, is the assumption you're interviewing a subject and trying to reach in with the microphone. That extra couple inches on the long handle will generally give you uh, a little bit of a benefit. So uh, other real popular Interview microphones would be the ElectroVoice 635 and uh, the RE50, very popular. Also the Sennheiser MD46, all great interview microphones, something that you should have in your package at all times because you never know when you might need it. Okay, so after dynamic microphones, you have what are called electret microphones. And electret micro microphones are microphones that have charged capsules, and they're charged usually by a battery of some sort. Electret microphones are significantly more sensitive than dynamic microphones, and they're often used for news, uh, ENG, uh, uh, lower end uh, productions. Um, they're very good microphones. Here's a great example of a uh, Electret microphone. This is a Sennheiser K6 ME66 Electret microphone, and this microphone, as you notice, has a pretty long, what's called an interference tube. And an interference tube actually takes the sound and moves it down the capsule and allows the microphone to be a little bit farther from the subject than a dynamic microphone, for example. They're not quite as sensitive as true condenser microphones, but they are very sensitive. If you're using an electret microphone in, say, an episodic or a feature setting, uh, you may introduce a little bit more noise into the system than you would with a true condenser. And the reason for that is it's not quite as sensitive as the true condenser. If you use an Electret microphone to get the same range on it that you would on a true condenser microphone, you're going to have to raise the gain up just a little bit farther. And that usually introduces just a little bit more noise in the system. Not really important if you're doing news or uh, 
non-critical recording, but if you're doing a feature or episodics, it's something that you might want to think about. Now, compared to the um, dynamic microphone we tried, this microphone is significantly more sensitive. Now, if you look at this microphone and I put it right up to my mouth, it could actually overdrive the system. You have to be very careful about that sort of thing. This microphone is really designed to be held a foot or two away from the mouth, usually above the head, and you can get pretty good dialogue. Part of it is the sensitivity, part of it is the extended interference tube that's allowing you to grab the sound directly in front of it. Another advantage of the shotgun microphone, this is a, an example of an Electret shotgun microphone, is that it rejects the noise outside of its direct pattern. It, it's going to take noise that's outside and it's going to reduce that level significantly and focus directly on what the microphone is pointed at. A true gauge of how good a microphone is is how well it rejects sound off axis. So um, when you're trying out microphones and you're listening to microphones, don't just listen to the quality of the sound. Also listen to how much noise it introduces into the system uh, when you raise the gain up nice and hot. And um, also look at the pattern. How wide is the pattern and what are you going to be uh, using the microphone for? Uh, the main patterns you're going to see are going to be omnidirectional. These are going to be microphones that pick up all the way around the microphone regardless. That uh, dynamic microphone that we showed you, uh, that's an omnidirectional microphone. In vocals, generally an omnidirectional is what you're going to see. However, in film sound, you're generally going to see very directional patterns like unidirectional or even um, supercardioids, which is what the uh, shotgun microphones are. Omni is going to be basically like this. If you're looking at the top of the microphone, it's going to look like that on, a, on an omnidirectional. A cardioid is going to be more like this. It's going to be more directional and focused. That's why they call it a shotgun. It aims directly at the subject that you're pointing at. And then you're going to have a cardioid, which is going to be a little wider like this. And you can usually get um, two subjects on a cardioid microphone. Here's a great example of a cardioid microphone. This is a Sennheiser MKH-50 one of the best microphones in the world. Now you notice this doesn't have a real long interference tube on it. It's not meant to grab dialogue at long distances, two or three feet, that you might have on a shotgun microphone. But it has a wider pattern. Rather than being very direct, it's going to be a little wider, just like that. And the, the advantage of that, of course, is if you have two people sitting at a table or two people standing next to each other, rather than trying to move the microphone to catch them both talking, you can actually hang this microphone directly above. The pattern is wide enough, it'll pick up both of your talent. So very good microphone to have in your kit is a good cardioid microphone. Microphones are like tools. They're like hammers, they're like drills, they're like wrenches. You need to have the right microphone for the right job. A dynamic microphone, an, a truly good interview microphone, that it's omnidirectional will be right for certain situations. A cardioid microphone is good for other situations, and of course you need the shotgun microphone, uh, either the Electret or the True Condenser. So this is the Sennheiser MKH-50 cardioid microphone. It's going to give you a much wider pattern than you're going to get on the shotgun microphone, so you can actually mic two people. Okay, now we're listening to the ME66, and uh, I'm going to move the microphone just a little bit from my mouth, and you notice that I fall off axis much quicker with the ME66. When I'm talking, I drop off much quicker with the ME66 because it's a very focused pattern. The shotgun microphone is a super cardioid. It's very, very focused as opposed to the MKH-50, which gave me just a little bit more wide pattern to accommodate uh, maybe two people who are speaking at the same time. Many microphones will have what's called a low cut filter built into them. And what that allows you to do is to roll off the lower frequencies if you're having problems. And you'll often have problems with either uh, a breeze or in a building with an air conditioner and you'll want to roll off the lower end so you don't catch that rumbling when you're doing the audio. So um, many microphones will have a low cut roll off on them. Some mixers will bypass this and do the low cut roll off at the actual mixing panel itself or uh, somewhere else in the chain. Um, I find it's best to do it directly at the microphone and take care of it right there. Then the switch just below it is a 10 dB pad and that basically just pads down the audio a little bit in case you have uh, something you're recording that's very high SPL, very loud. We want you to hear the air conditioning that is going off in the background. 
Okay, what you're hearing is the air conditioning in this room and you're hearing the MKH-50 microphone, which is flat, okay? What we're going to do now is we're going to engage the low cut filter on it and listen to how the um, air conditioning is affected by uh, the loss of the low end. Okay, now here's the MKH-50 with the low cut roll off engaged. you should hear an audible difference on the roll-off. Now you can roll off the microphone, you usually can roll off also at the mixer, um, but it's one of those things you want to listen to very carefully. Okay, this is the MKH-50 with the low-cut roll-off disengaged, but with the uh, 10 dB pad engaged. So this should be a little less sensitive, um, with a little less reach. If you're recording something that's very loud, you might want to engage um, the 10 dB pad. So uh, here's an MKH416, and <clears throat> if you compare this to either the Electret or the Dynamic, you're going to see that this is a much more sensitive microphone. This microphone has greater reach, lower noise, and is a better microphone overall. You can almost pound nails with it. It's that good. So that brings us to another topic, which is really, really important. You know, they say first things first. Well, first things are location. A lot, it's amazing how many directors don't take into account that their location is next to a freeway. They don't take into account that their location is right next to a construction site. And when they get to the site, all of a sudden, it's a mess because you really can't hide that kind of noise. So um, always check that out. Also make sure that when you're doing an indoor shoot, just like this, that you have access to the control of the air conditioning because the air conditioning noise can be an issue. You want to be able to turn off the air conditioning when you're rolling and turn it back on so you don't suffocate your cast and crew. Very important things to think about when you're choosing where you're going to shoot and what your locations are. Not to be too obvious, but this is a mic clip. And a mic clip comes with pretty much any microphone that you purchase. Mic clips are good. They hold microphones. Uh, they're, they're meant to be used with microphone stands. Uh, you really don't want to use this in any other configuration because they also transmit audio directly through them and onto the microphone. And if you have a real sensitive microphone, you'll get bad audio. It sounds bad. That's why you utilize these. And these are called shock mounts. And here's an example of a shock mount with a camera shoe on it so that you can utilize it directly onto your camera. And what happens is you see that these rubber bands here, they isolate the microphone from the actual mount itself because the camera is rolling and any motion from the microphone, the motor, the drive, anything else that's humming or buzzing or clicking or anything, that sound is going through the shock mount, but it's being stopped by the elastics here. Okay, so you never want to use something like this on top of your camera because it's just going to transmit all the noise directly into the microphone. You want to use something like this. Now here's another example of a very nice shock mount. This one's by KTEC. This one's by PSC, by the way. This one's by KTEC. And you notice this one does not have a um, hot shoe mount on the bottom. It's designed to be mounted on the bo bottom of, or excuse me, the top of a boom pole. Okay. And you see this is just a different style of elastics that are going to allow you to isolate the microphone from the mount itself and to keep the noise down. Always utilize this if you can. You're going to utilize the smaller, lighter shock mount with the smaller, lighter rubber bands for smaller and lighter microphones. If the microphone is larger or heavier, you'll need a stiffer elastic or mount material. And that's when you would utilize something like this. This is going to hold a heavier microphone and probably isolate um, significantly better than just the bands itself. Boom poles basically come in two flavors. They come in carbon fiber, which are very, very light, but a bit expensive. And then they come in aluminum, which are generally much heavier, but much less expensive. The general rule of thumb, of course, is if you're schlepping the boom pole, you pop for the carbon fiber. If you got somebody else doing it for you, then you go ahead and you get the aluminum stuff because you don't have to carry it around. This particular pole is a cabled pole. Now, generally a boom pole can come uncabled and uncabled boom poles are real popular back in the East. Why? I don't know. In the West Coast, we very rarely sell uncabled poles. Um, you have the internally cabled boom pole that can be either straight cabled like this or you can also get it 
in a configuration where it's a coil cable inside the pole. This particular version has a cable exit on the bottom and is a long pole. This pole is probably a 16 foot pole. Um, if you want to put a shock mount on it, you simply take the 3 8 adapter right on the top onto your shock mount. You screw it on just like this and voila. Then you push the release and you can adjust the shock mount any way that you like. Exactly where you want it. You put your microphone into the shock mount and you're good to go. Generally, if you're new in the business and you're on a budget, you're going to buy a aluminum pole. But as soon as you have the money, you're going to graduate up to a carbon fiber pole. They're much nicer, lighter, and uh, perform much better. Bottom line is you're really going to want a carbon fiber pole. Remember, they make boats out of carbon fiber. They make um, a lot of sturdy items with carbon fiber. So uh, if you treat the pole well, it'll, it'll do well for you in any environment. And a carbon fiber pole will be significantly lighter. And that's really everything. If you are standing on a set and you're schlepping a boom pole all day, a few ounces makes a huge difference. If you do not have a cabled pole, you have your microphone at the top of the pole, the cable coming down, and generally you are gaffer taping the um, cable to the actual pole itself. Uh, it's not very elegant, but some people have always worked that way and prefer that way. Um, but the ma vast majority of poles that we sell are either uh, cabled or coil cabled poles. And often you'll see a boom pole, this is not an example, that actually has the XLR on the bottom of the pole. So the boom operator will just plug his cable directly in the end here. It's internally cabled through the pole, comes out the top just like this one does, and you plug directly into the microphone at the top. And the key to noise is not to slide your hand. You know, you want to make sure that you're gripping the pole like this and you keep it steady when you move the pole around. And then if you lift your hand, you put it back very quietly. You don't slide around. That's very important. There's always a great question about how do you handle booms and wide shots and you really have to play that by ear. As I said earlier, you always want to put a boom in if you can. You always want to use the high, hard wired mic wherever you can. But if the director requires such a wide shot that you can't get the microphone in close enough to get good dialogue, that's when you revert to wireless microphones. At that point, you really have no choice. Sometimes directors will actually be running a widen a shot and a tight shot at the same time and you're really in deep trouble so the only way you can solve that is with wireless microphones. You can run a boom pole either above the head or below the head. What you really need to do is be conscious of the frame lines. You have to be conscious of whether your microphone is in the shot or not. Other than that you can really place the microphone anywhere you like. Try to get it as close to the mic as to the mouth as possible. That's the most important thing. I think the largest myth in filmmaking regarding to, fa to sound is the myth of we'll fix it in post. Generally, if you get the sound and the performance that you want on location at the time that you do it, you'll get a superior product. You want to always be careful of racing through the production and not allowing the sound department to get the performance that's being given to you at that particular moment. It's also very expensive to bring talent back in after the fact to do voiceovers. So always take the time to get the best audio possible and save yourself time and money down the line uh, having to redo it in post-production. You can fix it in post, but it's very expensive to do so. Well, ADR is generally um, adding tracks after the production has been shot. Bringing an actor back in and having him redo the lines syncing to film because the production audio was unusable. Generally, the production audio is unusable because of extraneous noise. Once again, the location was next to a freeway, next to a construction zone, next to a parking lot. Um, the director decided not to hold for the airplane that's passing over and nobody could control the air conditioning and there's a continuous low frequency hum going through the audio track. You've lost it, maybe you can't uh, fix it with equalization. You've got to bring the actors back in to record the dialogue and that can be incredibly expensive.
Foley would be the, um, the art of recreating sounds other than the voice. Footsteps, clinking glasses, uh, windows rattling, any noise that you want to add to the soundtrack later that you're not actually going to get at the production location you would do in Foley. Why, why don't you just put one microphone over a rock and roll band and record it? The reason is you want to isolate your dialogue from everything else that you're doing. You want to record the dialogue so there's nothing else there. Then you can add the layers of audio on top of that, the footprints, the music, all the different sounds that make the overall soundtrack are added individually. So you want to isolate those sounds and that's why you can do it in, in um, fully. Okay, so I'm using the ubiquitous Sennheiser MKH416 microphone. This is a very common microphone for recording production dialogue, probably the most widest used microphone in the world. Coincidentally, this microphone is also the most common microphone used for Foley. So we want to give you an example of uh, separating your dialogue track from your Foley track. So if I'm speaking to you and I'm going to tap on the table, I don't really want to hear the tap in the live sound production track. I want to add that later. So you'll see me talking. Let's, let's assume that this microphone is actually aimed over my head so uh, you're actually getting what I'm saying. And so let's say that I go to tap the table. This is what you're going to hear. Well, that's not really as convincing as you might like on the audio track. What you would do then is go back and record in Foley the tapping of the table and add that to the soundtrack a little later. Listen to the difference of this versus this. One is much more distinct, much more convincing, and because it would be on a separate track, you can mix that to the volume that you like and put it together the way you want it to sound. Okay, this is a foam windscreen. They come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Uh, this one's for a ball style microphone like the SM58. Uh, foam windscreens are also available for cardioid microphones and shotgun microphones. Um, but they're really only good for indoor use. They're useless if you're going to get any sort of a breeze outdoors or any windy situation. So a foam windscreen should really only be used in an indoor environment. If you get outdoors and you have a little bit of wind, it can really ruin a soundtrack because the low end rumbling of the wind touching the diaphragm or the microphone capsule uh, of a microphone will upset the soundtrack. So one of your options would be um, a foam little furry cover like this. This is called a furry um, this one's made by Koala, and if you look inside, you'll see that there's a cavity in here for the microphone to fit inside. This one's actually designed to go over a foam windscreen, so you see the cavity is actually pretty big. So you would actually have the foam windscreen on the microphone. You would slide this over, and the fur on these uh, wind covers dissipate the wind and help protect the microphone and, uh, and really help you out getting good production dialogue out in the field. This is an inexpensive way. This is a really a supplement to the foam windscreen that you have on your microphone. But if the wind gets particularly stiff, this really isn't going to do the best job for you. Stepping up from this would be something that's called a softy. Kind of the same thing, only instead of a thin foam windscreen, this actually has its own open cell foam structure inside and the microphone slides directly inside and cradles around the microphone and then of course you still have the furry cover on the outside to protect it from wind. Significantly better wind protection on this than from just the furry cover but it does go up in price. Okay, If this doesn't work, if you're in a really stiff wind or if you have a particularly sensitive microphone, one of the higher end microphones like the Sheps CMIT5 or the Sennheiser MKH416 or MKH60, any of the high end true condenser microphones, you're probably going to want to put that microphone in a true Zeppelin configuration. Now here's the example of a Zeppelin. The microphone lives inside of this and inside of this particular Zeppelin you're going to see that there's a shock mount inside. So the microphone actually lives inside of this. 
This casing protects the microphone from low wind, and then there's actually a furry cover that goes around the outside for a high wind situation. This is the configuration you almost always see on a movie set, episodic television sets, or in a um, news conference situation where you're outside and it's real windy. You'll often see these Zeppelins in this configuration out there. You'll notice that it includes a shock mount, so you can mount it directly onto a stand or directly onto your boom pole. This is the most expensive way, but also the most efficient way to protect your microphones from wind and elements. This Zeppelin is also available with what they call a boom swivel. And the boom swivel basically allows you to go directly into uh, the boom pole without having the extra weight of the handle. Um, if you look at the Zeppelin itself, you see that it tapers down to a pistol grip shock mount. So you can actually, actu uh, you can actually hold it with your hand, or there's a 3 8 female thread on the bottom so you can mount it directly to the top of your boom pole. Yeah, there's actually two covers that you can utilize with this. Uh, one is called a high wind cover, which is actually like a flannel covering that goes over this. Um, and then there's the wind jammer, and the wind jammer is actually the furry cover that goes over it. In a very, very high wind situation, or if they're using huge fans, uh, you often will use not only the high wind cover, but then the wind jammer on top of that. I've also known mixers who put foam wind screens on the microphone inside the Zeppelin if it's a particularly high wind situation. Um, uh, it really depends on what you're willing to do. If you add the foam wind screen, the high wind cover, and the wind jammer, you will lose a little bit of top end on your audio. Now, sometimes you can make that up on your mixer by tweaking the equalizer up just a little bit, uh, and sometimes you cannot. Sometimes it's so important to lose the effects of the wind that you're willing to compromise a little bit of the high end in order to protect the microphone from the wind. On the, uh, the Zeppelin package, you can order it either as a complete package designed specifically for your microphone. They're packaged by size. So if you have a 416 or an MKH-60 or an Audio-Technic 4073A, you would order the specific Zeppelin for that microphone and uh, it would all come together. But you could also order it piecemeal if you want a replacement Zeppelin uh, shock mount or different clips for different microphones to use with the same Zeppelin. You can do that also. Okay, this is a pop screen, and this pop screen is used almost exclusively for singers in a studio and for voiceovers. It makes sure that when you pop your P's or hiss your S's, that the sibilance from both of those noises doesn't go into the microphone and affect the capsule. So you're normally going to use this only in a studio uh, environment for singing or for voiceovers. Okay, on the set you'll often hear a term called IFB, and that's for um, internal fold back. And what that means is you're taking a signal from your mixer, the production sound audio, and you're sending it out to others on the set. You'll often see that in a commercial environment also, where you have a lot of clients who want to hear the production audio. And what that generally involves is having a transmitter at the mixer and having a number of people that are holding receivers and they you will actually take the production audio put it into the transmitter and transmit out to the clients who want to hear the production audio so if somebody says do you have an IFB or can I get an IFB that generally means they want to hear the production track and you need to be set up to deliver that to a client okay so what you will want to do is take an output from your mixer either a microphone or line level output and input it into your transmitter, making sure that the levels match. If it's a line level output only from the mixer, then you want to make sure you have a padded cable going into your microphone level transmitter. You'll then give whomever wants the IFB signal a receiver that they can patch into and they can listen to the production audio. In audio, it's always very important to back yourself up. If you're recording to camera, always try to record to both tracks. Take your left channel and make that your main channel, and then take your right channel and record at about 6 dB lower. That gives you a little bit of protection against distortion. If you have a second camera, record your audio track to both cameras. That way you always have a backup. And of course, if you have a recorder, record to the recorder as your main source and record as your camera as your backup, making sure that you have the audio on two sources in case there's a problem. For example, we're going to record the left channel 
um, which is channel number one, at a nominal rate, our normal record level. And then on the right channel, we're going to lower it about 6 dB. And this is going to protect us against distortion in case the talent or the person we're interviewing decides to shout or uh, something happens. So I'm going to raise my voice significantly louder so that you can hear the difference between the left channel and the right channel. How's that? You've given yourself protection on the right track, regardless of what happens on the left. You're going to want to use your left as your main audio, but you've got the right as a backup in case something happens because you've recorded it at a, just a slightly lower level to protect yourself. Okay, so we're going to make the assumption that you're going to record your film sound directly to camera, but you're still going to use a mixer between the microphone and the camera. The sound that goes directly to the camera and does not go through the mixer is very dangerous. You have no way of controlling the input gain or what's coming out and going directly into the camera if you don't put a mixer between the microphone and the camera. It's like practicing safe audio. If you don't put something between the mic and the camera, you're asking for a distortion disease and that's exactly what you're going to get. I brought a couple examples of mixers. This one is by a company called Sound Devices. This is one of the top four channel mixers uh, available in the world. Very popular, you're going to put it in a bag, you can run up to four microphones into this mixer, uh, mix your signal together, control the gain, supply the phantom power for the microphone, send the signal out to the camera so it can be recorded, and then you can also get a signal back from the camera that you can monitor at the mixer to make sure that what's going to tape is, is exactly what you want to hear. On this particular mixer there's four inputs, you're going to see that there's uh, phantom power and roll-offs, just like there were on the microphone on this particular one. Each input is mic line switchable, so you can put a microphone directly into it or an external source that has line level directly into it. And then you have 48-volt phantom power or 12-volt microphone power also. You can choose between the two. These, this mixer is battery-powered, or you can power it off of external DC and a power switch, meters for you to read so you can see exactly what's going into the mixer. If you look at the side of the mixer, you'll see this big connector right here. And this is a beta snake connector and a multi-pin connector. And what this allows you to do is to send your audio signal directly to the camera, get a signal back from the camera that you can monitor right here and not tie up your main outputs. So you could actually take this, send it to a secondary recorder if you wanted to, and not tie these up by using this multi-pin right here. And what the Beta Snake does for you is it gives you two main outputs so that you can send the signal directly to the camera, input so you can plug the signal directly into the uh, camera, and then you're going to use the headphone output from the camera to send the signal back to the mixer so you can monitor from it. Plus, there's an extra little female headphone jack so that the person operating the camera can still monitor from the camera because, of course, you're utilizing their headphone jack to get the signal back to the mixer. So this is very, very important and a great tool when you're doing film sound directly to a camera. Uh, there's also a, a series of other types of outputs, so you can do transcription or anything you want to do um, with that. Uh, each one is mic line switchable, so you can control the output of that particular mixer, if it's going to be a line level signal that's going out, or if it's going to be a microphone level going out. And there's a lot of flexibility with a mixer like this. A mixer like this is what you would use um, in a professional environment if you did this for a living. Okay, what we want to do is we want to give you a good example of what a uh, Sennheiser MKH-50 um, cardioid condenser microphone is going to sound like through a professional mixer. Uh, this microphone is plugged into a Sound Devices 442 uh, professional four channel mixer and we want you to listen to the difference between a signal that's going through the preamps in this particular mixer and going to your camera versus what it's going to sound like sending the signal directly into the camera and you'll see one of the reasons aside from safety 
um, of your audio signal and your audio path uh, of using a mixer is that you really are going to upgrade your mic pre's and your overall audio path by using a mixer, processing the signal through here and then sending it to your camera to be recorded. So this is what I sound like through a professional mixer. I've taken the MKH-50 and I'm running it directly through a Sound Devices 442 mixer. And what you're going to hear is the difference between the microphone preamps in this mixer versus the microphone preamps in your camera. And I think what you'll find is the audio quality is uh, significantly superior going through a professional mixer. So in addition to being able to control the gain and catch distortion before it goes to uh, the tape, uh, you'll also get better quality audio overall by utilizing the microphone preamps in the mixer. So hopefully what we're doing is we're duplicating uh, exactly what you heard um, with the mixer in line and now the microphone is going directly into the camera and I think you'll find that the quality of the microphone preamps in the camera really aren't up to snuff. They're not quite as good as the ones that you're going to find in the mixer. So this is just one other reason you really want to try to utilize a good quality mixer uh, between the microphone and the camera. Um, this PSC uh, DV Pro Mix 6 is an inexpensive six channel mixer. Um, this one you've already seen, this is the Sound Devices 442, which is a very high quality uh, four channel mixer. And both of these mixers are utilized in news, ENG, that sort of thing where you're going to throw the bag and the wireless or excuse me, throw the, um, the mixer and the wireless and everything in a bag and kind of run and gun. Very common uh, uh, utilization of a mixer. But when you're doing a feature film or episodic television, many professional sound mixers work off of a cart. And they have uh, the radio mic set up on the cart and they have all of their equipment uh, quickly accessible to them. They're not throwing things over their shoulder necessarily and running. And they're going to use a cart-based mixer. And this is a nice example of a cart-based mixer right here. This is the Cooper uh, CS306. And this is a great example of a cart-based uh, mixer. It's got six microphone inputs, and it's a four-bus system, which means you can assign any of these six to any four of these buses, and then take those buses and send them out to any sources that you want. This is um, the kind of mixer you would use on a feature film. It has a full communications section on it so that you can send uh, a, si a communication signal to your boom operator and your boom operator can communicate back to you. You can send separate feeds to the director and to other people on the set who need to be able to hear the production dialogue. A mixer like this gives you all the flexibility that you need to operate on a film or a television set. As I showed you with the portable mixers, if you look at the back of this mixer, what you're going to see is a whole series of inputs and outputs that you can utilize for film sound. And if you recognize this multi-pin right here, there's actually two of them here. And these allow you to, once again, send your signal to the camera, get a feed directly back, and monitor directly from there. You can also send signals to one or even two boom operators and monitor what's going on there. So the advantage of a mixer really is to allow you to take a multiple of signals from one or two boom operators, two, three wireless microphones all at one time, control the signal as they're coming in, equalize the signal, make sure that there's no distortion in the signal, and then control the output level of the signal going out to the camera and what you're recording. So I highly recommend always putting a mixer in between the camera and the microphone. Okay, um, if you decide that you are not going to record directly to camera, but that you want to record to an external recorder, you have a number of options. You can record directly to compact flash card, or you can record directly to a hard drive, or you can also go directly to a DVD RAM disc. I just wanted to show you this particular recorder. This is one of the more popular recorders in the film and television industry right now. It's by a company called Sound Devices, the same company that made the 442 mixer I showed you. And this little recorder is incredible. It records to both compact flash and to an internal 80 gig hard drive. So you have your main recording, plus you also have a backup internally in the unit. But wait, there's more. In this particular unit, it also has firewire output. So you can record to the 
compact flash card you can record to the hard drive while backing it up onto an external DVD RAM drive. What we're seeing is compact flash is still a little too expensive to become a media where you want to send it in to somebody else and then not get it back. So you want to burn to a media that um, is inexpensive and that you don't need to retrieve. So what we're finding a lot of our uh, mixers doing is they're recording to the compact flash and to the hard drive, plugging it into an external drive, burning a DVD RAM disc, and that's what they're turning in at the end of the day of production. If you're doing your own editing, then of course you can take the recorder directly into your editing suite. You can either download the files uh, via FireWire, or you can remove the compact flash card, drop that into a reader, download your files, and do your editing from there. This particular recorder is a four-track recorder, two mic and two line in, uh, and it also has time code. And time code is something we haven't really touched on much. Um, it's used particularly in film sound and in commercials. And uh, this particular unit has an internal time code clock. So you can either jam it externally from a camera that has time code, or you can use this as your master clock and jam a camera or a time code slate directly from this unit. Utilizing time code is really good, particularly for film because you're able to show the camera the time code slate that has the numbers uh, uh, on it and then easily sync up the camera with sound um, files that are in your editing system. Jamming time code is like syncing up two clocks. You'll choose one of your clocks as the master. Generally that's going to be your most accurate clock. You'll utilize that clock as the master and then you'll jam the secondary clock so that they match up. Then of course when you get into editing you'll line up the two numbers and then in theory the picture and the sound should match. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about shotgun microphones and, and how you're going to use those in a uh, production environment. Oftentimes, a shotgun microphone cannot be used if the shot is too wide and you can't get it in there, or if there are other reasons that you can't get a microphone in the scene. Um, in those situations, you're going to use a wireless microphone. Wireless microphones are widely used for reality TV, for feature films, for television, virtually every um, a film application or video application you can think of. When you're going to use wireless microphones, you want to try to use them as sparingly as possible. And the only reason for that is that you're relying on a lot of technology to get your sound. As a rule of thumb, if you can use a wired microphone, a shotgun microphone, cardioid microphone, something wired directly to your mixer or to your camera, you should go that way. When you cannot use a wired microphone, then you should go ahead and use a wireless microphone. The wireless microphone I'm going to show you right now this is manufactured by a company called Electrosonics. And Electrosonics is the premier wireless manufacturer for feature film and television production. Electrosonics uh, makes their products to the most rigorous standards possible, and that's why they're used in the professional world. These are v, uh, excuse me, UHF wireless. They operate in the UHF band. They have 256 channels that are tunable, and they're the highest powered transmitters that you can buy. Um, and that's important because the higher the power transmitter, the more kind of range you're going to get when you're using a wireless microphone. Now, let's focus on the receiver first. This particular receiver is a UHF 256 channel um, receiver. And you notice that there are two antennas on the receiver. This is what you might call a diversity system. It's actually called an antenna diversity system. And what that means is there's really two antenna sections within this receiver and they're both looking for the strongest signal possible. You'll often see receivers that have a single antenna um, that are non-diversity. They have a single antenna system. This one actually has a dual antenna system. In a situation where you have a lot of competing RF signals, generally a diversity system is going to uh, provide you with better performance. A diversity receiver will not necessarily get you better range. It simply deals with complicated RF signals in a much more complicated and better manner than a non-diversity system does. So in generally speaking, you want to get a diversity receiver where you can. Now you'll often see inexpensive, um, 
inexpensive diversity systems and you'll also find expensive diversity systems and the main difference between the two is how well they handle the spurious or outside RF and the good systems um, will perform really well in those environments. These uh, receivers are portable and generally are going to take a balanced XLR output and go directly to your mixer or to your camera. Multiple channels. If you have a single channel wireless, and they're becoming less and less frequent now, but, but if you have a single channel wireless and you get into an environment that's a high RF environment, you could get stuck. You really want to look for a wireless that has multiple channel um, capability so that you can uh, find an open frequency no matter where you go. There are many wireless systems out there that have 100, 200 systems, but there's no way for you to know what frequency is actually available for you to use. So if you can, you want to find a wireless system that allows you to actually scan your environment and park your wireless where there's no audio available. And this, this particular system does. Uh, there are other systems out there. Sennheiser makes um, a system, the EW112 uh, system, that uh, does that also. Very important, particularly if you're going from one system city to another often, you will find that TV stations are, are uh, active in different cities and different places and you may have to move your frequencies around. So that's very important. Let's look at the transmitter now. This is a Electrosonics UM400A transmitter. It's 100 milliwatts transmitter power. Um, in comparison to your standard wireless, um, you're going to find those are usually between 30 and 50 milliwatts. The Electrosonics is 100 milliwatts. It's also 256 channels tunable. Now, if you take a look at the front here, you're going to see a TA5F connector for inputting your lavalier microphone directly into it. You're also going to see an on-off switch here. You see it light up there telling you, okay, there we go. And you see a gain control in the front here that allows you to adjust just how hard the microphone is hitting the transmitter. And of course, this is going to be your antenna right here. Now, just like on the wired microphones I showed you earlier, you see that on this transmitter, there's also a steppable low-cut roll-off. So if you're in a situation where if I were standing in, in hard wind and you wanted to roll off that low frequency, you could do so right here. What else? And then right here on this side of the transmitter, you see an open trap door, and this is where you can change the frequencies. You would scan from the receiver to find the open frequency. The receiver would then tell you what switch settings to use on the transmitter, and then you would set it. Okay, we're going to show you um, how this particular receiver, the Electrosonics UCR411, will scan for an open frequency. What you want to do on this particular wireless is you want to push all three buttons simultaneously. As you can see, it's going in a scan mode. This particular receiver, I believe, is on block 21 uh, on Electrosonics, and it's scanning. And you can see that as it goes through, it's looking for TV stations and other RF. So it's not looking for an open channel, per se. It's simply scanning the RF in this area and telling you where you can go and get yourself an open signal. What you, when you're looking at it here, you can see these blocks here that you cannot use. But you can see between these two blocks you have here, there's an open space right there. And you could park your wireless right there. So what you can do is you can stop it and park it right. It's like baseball. You hit them where they ain't. Then once you've done that, this particular one is going to tell you, excuse me, 9, 8. And then you go to your transmitter and you set these two on 9 and then 8. They'll be on the same frequency and then you're good to go. So here's a great example of a lavalier microphone. And you're going to use a lavalier microphone with the transmitter. This one, is, this one in particular is a Tram TR50. And it's outfitted with a TA5F uh, mini XLR connector. Very common microphone, particularly with film. Um, you just take this microphone and you plug it directly into there. And of course, you're not plugged into this, so you can't hear it, but basically, this is how you operate it. This is how I'm wearing this uh, particular microphone here. On a lavalier microphone, it's much like a plug-in microphone. You want the right lav for the right situation. The vast majority of lavalier microphones are going to be omnidirectional microphones. And the reason for that is, the one I'm wearing, for example, now is an omnidirectional microphone. And the reason for that is, 
is if your talent turns their head, you don't go too far off axis. If you use a cardioid microphone, narrow pattern, remember just like the other one we showed you, if you use a cardioid pattern, the talent turns their head, you kind of lose their voice, and that can be a problem when you're doing a video production. You'll most often see a cardioid lavalier microphone in a live situation where you're trying to avoid, fe avoid feedback. You've got a very live stage situation. Somebody who's doing a seminar might use a cardioid microphone if they've got a very live stage and they're trying to avoid feedback. But once again, they have to be careful about turning their head and losing some of the audio. What we often see is people com who complain about a lack of range aren't driving their transmitter hot enough. So I just want to show you that you see both green lights here are lit up showing the gain that you have and you really want to get to where it's just occasionally hitting the red. One, one, one. You want to drive your uh, transmitter as hot as possible to increase your RF range. One, one. See, that's a good level right there. The general rule of thumb is usually run your transmitter gain at 12 o'clock, start it there, and then drive it up to 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock until you get really where you want to be, the hottest signal possible. The hotter the signal, the better the RF, the better the range. And the Tram RE50 can be purchased in a couple different configurations. One, pre-wired for a wireless microphone or hardwired into a microphone power supply. But normally when we sell these microphones, we'll sell them with a disconnect on them. This particular microphone is wired for electrosonics, and the power supply for it is also wired for electrosonics on the top. So if you want to use this microphone with a electrosonics wireless, you just plug it directly into the transmitter. TA5F to TA5M and it operates because the transmitter is going to supply the voltage directly to the microphone to operate it. However, if you're going to plug it directly into your camera, you may not have the power to operate the microphone. If that's the case, you have to have a separate power supply. By plugging the microphone into the power supply here, you now have an XLR output and the XLR output can go directly to the camera. This is what's called hardwired. Once again, when you can hardwire, you should always hardwire. You're taking the whole wireless RF issue out of the equation if you can hardwire a microphone. So this is always going to be the best uh, configuration. If you purchase it like this, then in the situation where you need to use a wireless, you simply disconnect and plug it back into the transmitter. Usually microphones will come with some semblance of clips. You'll usually get a tie clip, maybe a tie bar, and a windscreen. The nice thing about these tram microphones is they come with a full assortment of clips. And this is a tie clip, and you're usually going to use this in an interview situation where you're not really concerned with concealing uh, the microphone. This is going to go directly onto the shirt just like this. You'll drop the microphone into this clip. You'll also get a tie tack, which you can use to put directly into the shirt and put this behind the fabric. Okay, and this is a foam windscreen that you use with lavalier in outdoor situations, but not in a stiff wind. Every manufacturer does it differently with tram, uh, microphone mounts directly onto the clip here, and then the, the windscreen goes directly on that, so then you would wear it like this. Okay, we want to talk a little bit about headphones now. The majority of headphones you're going to find are equalized for listening to music, so you want to be careful about ordering just any pair of headphones. When you're mixing sound, you generally want the flattest frequency response possible. These Sony 7506 headphones are the most popular in the uh, industry because they have a very flat response. Uh, they're not accentuating the low end, they're not accentuating the high end, uh, they sound really mediocre when you're listening to music, but that's exactly what you want. You want a flat headset when you're mixing sound so you can hear exactly what's going to tape as opposed to something that's artificially equalized. You also want to choose a pair of headphones that you can wear all day long. Comfort is a primary concern when you're wearing a headset all day. The nice thing about these 7506s also is that they fold up very small, so if you're trying to put them in a bag, um, they don't take a lot of space up in your production bag, so that's why uh, these headphones are so popular. These headphones also have coil cable on them. Helps keep them out of your way when utilizing it. You see here this has a 
mini connector on it, but there's also an adapter on it for quarter inch, so you can utilize it either way, either with the little stereo mini or with the quarter inch. We also, here at Location Sound, we modify the quarter inch adapters to mono because there are applications where uh, you'll want a mono signal to go into a pair of headphones, and we do that here. Okay, we're going to talk about two different kinds of microphones. We're going to talk about hardwired microphones, and we're going to talk about wireless microphones. Now, in the hardwired microphone family, we have really three kinds of microphones we need to know. We need to know what a dynamic microphone is. We need to know what an electret microphone is. And we also need to know what a true condenser microphone is. Within those categories, we're going to talk about microphone patterns. And the three patterns we need to be concerned with are going to be omnidirectional, cardioid, and supercardioid. Now, in the Dynamic microphones, you probably all have seen this one. This one is an SM58 by Shure. It's the most common microphone in the world. Every rock and roll band in the world has about 30 of these. They throw them down, they throw them into the audience, they do any number of things. Um, this is one of the most indestructible microphones in the world. It's very insensitive, and the reason it's very insensitive is because it's designed to be held right up to the mouth. It's designed to be screamed into and it's not very sensitive. If you try to use this in a situation where you're mounting it on a camera, you're going to be very disappointed because it's not going to give you the kind of reach that you want. But it's not designed for that. The kinds of microphones that are designed to give you the kind of reach you need for film sound are going to be what are called shotgun microphones. This is an Electret shotgun microphone. This one uh, in particular is the Sennheiser K6 ME66. It's more sensitive than the dynamic microphone because it, had, it runs off of battery power and the battery actually sensitizes the capsule and gives it greater reach. Very common microphone for film use, very common for documentaries, uh, for um, ENG, for news, um, uh, used all over the world very good microphone, very durable, very popular. You're not normally going to use an Electret microphone for a film application, however. And the reason for that is it is less sensitive even than a true condenser microphone. And when it's a less sensitive microphone, what you're going to get is more noise introduced in the system. Now the noise that an Electret microphone may introduce into the system is very low but it could be enough to be the difference between good sound and great sound. In news, ENG, documentaries, it may not be such an issue, but in episodic television or feature films, you're going to want the absolute quietest and most sensitive microphone that you could get. To get that, you're going to move to a true condenser microphone. This is the most popular true condenser microphone in the world. It has been for about 20 years. This is a Sennheiser MKH-416. If you have to pick one microphone to use for film sound, if you can only afford one microphone to use for your sound, this is really the microphone you want to get. It's about $1,000, uh, give or take, depending on where you get it. But this is basically the microphone that's been used on every motion picture for the last 20 years. Uh, it is a true condenser microphone. It's significantly more sensitive than either of the microphones I previously showed you. It is very quiet and it has very good reach. And when I say reach, a lot of people have a misconception about that. They think that you can get a shotgun microphone and you can hold it 15, 20 feet from somebody and, uh, and get good sound. That's not the case. When we say reach, we're usually talking a foot and a half up to a maximum of three feet where you're going to put the microphone on a boom pole and hold it directly above talent. Just like that. But this is the kind of microphone you want to use. Now, if you're using your camera as your audio recorder, and if your camera supplies 48 volt phantom power, then you should use a true condenser microphone. That will give you the best results. What we're finding is a lot of these prosumer cameras have fantastic picture, but they don't have real advanced audio sections, and they may not supply phantom power for a microphone. In that case, you have two options. You can either purchase an external phantom power supply to operate this microphone, or you go back to the Electret microphone, which is battery powered, which does not require phantom power. 
Not every product is going to be within your budget. Not every product is going to fit within your mix. Um, the best thing to do before you buy a product is to rent. And there are many rental houses like Location Sound, many others around the country who have professional audio gear that you can rent for very inexpensive and try out. So I always recommend before you buy a piece of audio gear, a wireless, a mixer, a recorder, anything like that, that you go to a professional audio house. You check it out. Maybe rent it for a few days. S try it out. See how it works for you before you make your purchase because the right audio gear will help make your product better than ever.